So um, as we have been talking about moving our GN series and transplantation series into uh, a more formal project echo format, which is really a all teach, all learn opportunity where anybody can learn and anybody can teach. Um, and I think they have a very um, uh, formal and uh, very prescribed way to run similar sessions, usually case-based. So eventually, you know, uh, we hope that we switch from uh, lecture series to case space, and I think that's the that's the plan. And um, so there will be CME credits associated with this. I think we will the CME application was already play, uh, submitted to the University of New Mexico, and they are in the process of approval. I haven't heard final approval yet, but I submitted all the lecture the the topic list, etc. So hopefully we'll have that approval soon, and then. Uh, we will run the sessions uh, on this format, which is similar. We are already doing that. It's just like, you know, they will offer us C CME credits. So um, they have some disclosures, which I think this, this is the templated slide. So, so this is the um, today's uh, plan. So today I will cover membranous nephropathy with the talk about the new antigens. I think I've given this talk once in, um, uh, Pakistan in a PSN meeting and uh, a similar version when I came to New Jersey, but there are since then discovery of new antigens and some guidelines about how we manage these patients using the PLA2R. So I will discuss those updates. Uh, my goal and hope is not to board the group with too much uh, deep science, uh, but I think um, some of the slides are, are there just to acknowledge and appreciate the science behind it because it's really the bench to the bedside book which is which has led to a lot of progress in the membranes so some of my disclosures and uh, um, I do want to specifically um, talk about the majesty study which is Roche and Genentech they are, they are the sponsors so this is really uh, a phase three randomized open label a uh, trial comparing a, a new drug. Uh, I highlighted the name. Uh, it's one of the new monoclonal antibodies in patients with primary membranous nephropathy. So it compares the this ob new tuzolumab with the ticrolimus. Uh, uh, we haven't started that trial yet. Um, I think I just had the investigator meeting, but I think this is an important disclosure, uh, which I do want to mention, but I don't have any uh, anything related to this drug in the presentation though. So today we cover some of the back, like basics, although Dr. Aga did a wonderful job in, into covering the basics. The antibodies, PLA2R, THS, D7A, new antigen biomarkers, and how do we use clinically. So um, uh, membranous, I, I'm sure uh, you all uh, are familiar. This is a one of the leading cause of nephrotic sy syndrome in adults. Uh, it shares like 30, 35% uh, along with the FSTS. Um, despite of that, it's rare. The incidence uh, is one, in, one into 100,000, two is to one male predominance. So males are unfortunately um, disadvantaged for this disease as well. Um, onset in fourth and fifth decade, although, oops, sorry. That was not my intention. Um, that was, um, uh, but I have seen younger and older patients as well. It's really a very organ specific renal limited autoimmune disease. Um, just think about, think like that. It's in, so we, we, if we focus on this like an autoimmune disease, we can manage this as, as an autoimmune disease. We don't know what starts this really. And then um, a very variable clinical course. So a third of patient just go into spontaneous remission. They may look on the surface exactly the same, but a third of the patient may go into spontaneous remission, a third remains with proteinuria and a third progress to ESRD. I think now with the new discovery of the antibody and the level of antibody, now we are able to predict some of those spontaneous remitters. I think the science is progressing and, and it, the treatment has been the really non-selective toxic immunosuppressive agents, although hopefully we will have more targeted uh, approach. And when you look at the pathology, I think uh, um, it's a good section. This is uh, capillary lumen. You can see the RBC inside. 
Uh, this is the basement membrane, uh, subendothelial site, subepithelial site. This is the protocyte. And you can see that uh, all these deposits, which are subepithelial deposits, and the, some of the foot process effacement you can appreciate. So uh, glomerular filtration barrier, this group already knows what it is. I don't want to waste too much time, but really it's the basement membrane on one side, endothelium and the fenestration on the, on the endothelial side and the foot processes with the slit diaphragm. Um, stages of the membranous has been uh, described like really the histopathological stages. So it starts, you know, it's really the disease progression. You start with the subepithelial immune complex deposits, which the big arrow you can see. Uh, it progresses. So there is like this new growth of the GBM um, that surrounds the subepithelial deposits. So th these are the spikes you see. And then um, the stage three is really the spikes kind of um, outgrow. This is how basement membrane reacts to all these deposits, which is antibody antigen complexes. And then the uh, it becomes intramembranous rather than remaining subepithelial. But um, as you could see that it's, it is still on the subepithelial side of the basement membrane. And then in the stage four, really these deposits are the burnt out and washed out and the basement membrane remains now thickened because it remained infl inflamed. So stage one, two, three, four are, as you can see, the natural progression of the disease. You start with the deposit, the basement membrane sends some spikes or the troopers to engulf those deposits, then completely captures it and then kind of you know, wash, wash away. Um, so, uh, silver stain, anytime, I think if we have the, our, uh, tra trainees, I always mention that anytime you have a board question and you see the word silver stain men mentioned, you automatically lean towards membranous nephropathy, as you could see that on the silver stain, they really, they saw these, uh, projections of the basement membrane, um, and those gaps were really where the deposits are. Uh, and when the IF was done, uh, this was IgG staining, uh, predominantly IgG4, and there was C3 as well. And it, again, it's in the uniform uh, in a subepithelial distribution, really corresponding to where the, uh, the, the action is happening. Um, uh, again, I think um, uh, belaboring the same point, you can see um, in the membranous, you eventually get to see a thick basement membrane, which has deposits in foot process basement, which we have discussed. I think we, we covered that several times in the previous discussions. So um, historically we have classified this into either idiopathic, which was 70 to 75% or secondary. Uh, in the secondary cancer, infectious etiologies, autoimmune and Allomune, like you know, transplantation and some de novo in the transplantation were, were some of the secondary causes, but really the a big chunk, two third, one third remain idiopathic. Uh, and, and drugs as well, I think missed that. So cancer, infection, autoimmune, and drugs. Uh, the how you differentiate between primary and secondary. So the uh, primary has more IgG4 and C3 deposits. If you see a full house, this is usually secondary. Uh, and then when you see secondary form, it's either mesangial or subendothelial deposits. If you remember, the primary has subepithelial, secondary has subendothelial. Although from the surface, from you, you, you know, a lot of features they, they share even between primary and secondary. Uh, historical preview back in 1950s, um, uh, Heyman nephritis model was ex explained really. Uh, this was the rack model of uh, uh, membranous nephropathy. Uh, and they actually really took the crude kidney extracts and injected in the mice and there was the, 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 the response. But the target antigen was megalin, which was not expressed in the human podocyte. So we really did not know what is the megalin equivalent on the human side. Uh, some of the mechanism, I think, again, this is basics, but I think it's good to understand. So we go, like, why these subepithelial deposits were formed in some of the experimental model. I think this, uh, most of you have seen this uh, uh, beautiful cartoon by Dr. Glossack, so which describes, so either 
there are these small circulating immune complexes. So the antigen antibody, these immune complex complexes are preformed. They get filtered through the barrier, endothelial side get through the basement membrane. And once they reach the subepithelial side, now they're trapped there. The doors there, they, they just get stuck there. And that's where you know you see the, the reaction or response. And this is the reason for sub. Uh, epithelial. So this model is really described in the serum sickness. This is what happens. There are preformed immune complexes, gets filtered, got stuck on the subepithelial sites, reaction there, and you see the deposits. In hemonephritis, what their uh, uh, model, which is actually in the membranous nephropathy model predominant is like, there are circulating antibodies, which are, once they are in the serum, they get filtered, they have these native antigens. So the antigen that is part of the, um, uh, this architecture, so antibodies, antigen immune complexes are formed and you see the reaction. There was another model, which is uh, called planted antigen. Oops, I think my, um, so this was really, you had these non-native antigens that gets filtered first. Then they got stuck on the subepithelial side. Now there were circulating antibodies which passed through and then created this reaction. So three models. One is the preformed immune complexes, serum sickness model. They got filtered and caused the subepithelial um, uh, deposits. The middle one is, which is most commonly seen in the membranous, when you have an antigen, which is a native podocyte antigen, Whenever there are antibodies, they get filtered and cause the response. And then either the circulating non-native planted antigen. So they, they get planted there, got stuck, antibodies come, you know, the reaction happens. So back to uh, uh, bench to the bedside. This was uh, uh, finally, you know, we back in 2009, we, we, we made huge discovery all the way back in like 10, maybe seven years before this paper, there was another report from the Canadians, but I think I'll focus on the uh, PLA2R discovery. So this was the um, uh, landmark paper published by Dr. Beck in Salon. So really it identified um, this 185 kilodalton a protein, I'm sure you're all aware, uh, identified as a, uh, a PLA2R uh, receptor, which was present in 70% of patients with idiopathic membranous nephropathy uh, and was not seen in the secondary membranous nephropathy or other diseases like FSCS, diabetic nephropathy, and they had a, a lot of nephrotic syndromes. So it is present in podocytes. Uh, and anytime there is antibodies which is generated, you see the response. What creates antibody? We, we still like. I don't think we know. So they 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 showed us that the IgG4, which is the predominant antibody, we, we just we knew that in the membranous, uh, that was really the anti PLA2 or antibody was. And I think with all of these experiments, you will see the beauty of co-localization. So they, they did follow-up experiment and then these antibodies, you know, perfectly co-localized. So they, uh, uh, this, this is how it got confirmed. This is how PLA2R look like. Um, it has this constant endocytic recycling at the plasma membrane. Uh, again, I think uh, how the antibodies are generated, uh, what starts this production, we still don't know. And, we have made some progress in how the antibody uh, causes its um, a damage, but still the, the more specifics to follow, whether this is complement dependent or independent activity agonist or antagonist. This is how I think they, they produce in their original paper. But then I think there were some studies when uh, done, which maybe like a, a wrench in the process was like, they found that the PLA2R was present in 70, 80% of patients with idiopathic membranes, but it was also associated less than 10% in the lupus, um, hepatitis B, and I think some of the cancer patients as well. So there were a lot of uh, discussion about this paper. And I think some of the uh, discussions were that, what if these patients have two processes? But nonetheless, I think this was, um, 
some background that in a original paper thought it's 100% specific and 70% sensitive, but we found it in other, case, other cases too. But if you have it, you know, um, uh, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's high yield that this is primary or um, previously described idiopathic membranes. So as with the discovery of the first uh, antigen and detection of the antibody, which is now a commercially available test, you can do ELISA, you can do immunofluorescence, although ELISA is more common. So there was um, like really a zeal and a discovery process to find other antigens. So THS D7A was the other candidate, uh, thrombospondin type one domain containing 7A. Uh, again, I think this, is, this was found in 10% of the cases. The first one was 70% of the cases. So remaining 10%, this was found. It's slightly different molecule. The antigen is 250 kilodalton site. Um, and it's size-wise, it's different, but it shares a lot of same features as PLA2R, um, like IgG4 subclass, uh, the presence in the non-reduction state, which was, by the way, one of the reasons why this, these antigens were not discovered, because in the lab process, they were doing a lot of testing in the reduced state, not in the non-reduced state, which actually led to discovery of these antigens. Um, and I think they, the response to treatment, so this was a patient with a level of antibody positive when cyclosporin and prednisone were started, the, uh, the level actually came down, both the antibody level as well as the protein level. And there was a famous case report when uh, a patient who had a THS D7A positive membranous and developed a metastatic gallbladder cancer even the tumor and the lymph nodes express this antigen. Uh, and once they started treating the cancer with, with chemotherapy, the antibody disappeared and proteinuria came down from five gram to 0.7. Um, so there were some series done to see how much of the positive TS, THS7, uh, D7A is associated with cancer. So 16 to 20%, if you have this, antigen or anti, like antibody present, you can, uh, there was association with the cancer. Uh, PLA2R, I think there was a large uh, genetic study and they found maybe there is a genetic association, but I have not seen a lot of buzz about this uh, genetic association in the follow-up literature. So, so, so we discussed about two of the um, native antigen, which uh, we have now discovered the antibodies. We, I also talked about a planted antigen, like, you know, uh, like on, on this third side, like, you know, what about there was a non-native antigen that gets filtered. So this was interesting, again, like a small uh, level, um, uh, a case series and detection when the, uh, this is a pediatric uh, case series when in June, 2011, uh, this group, I think uh, they discovered that the infants who were drinking cow milk less than one year of age, some of them developed membranous nephropathy because the uh, albumin actually got filtered through the uh, infantile gut barrier, which is not very mature. And really that planted antigen, uh, I mean, that antigen get planted in the subepithelial space and those children got the membranous. And I think as they stopped the, uh, giving them uh, the, the, the cow milk, actually the disease process resolved itself without needing um, any treatment. But these patients were PLA2 or negative. And I think they have done the same level of testing with um, co-localization and it confirmed all that. So uh, I, I will move next to the, uh, to, to appreciate the science as discussed the discovery of some of the new antigen, because I think as, as, uh, uh, as I remember when I was giving the talk about, uh, uh, about this talk when I was in Pakistan last year in the PSN meeting, I think a day or two before this paper got published, when they found uh, NEL1, which is uh, another um, molecule which they associate with the, which is uh, associated with membranous nephropathy. It's, mean age 63 male ratio one is to one. And again, this has association with the cancer and malignancy. 
So they thought maybe 10 to 30% association with cancer and remainder was primary NEL1 membrane. So similar to uh, what we have the primary PLA2R and this was IgG1 dominant. And uh, we were, at, I think the scientists were able to discover some antibodies against this antigen. And I remember, I think on the, on the Twitter, uh, Dr. Beck, who's the, who discovered the original uh, uh, PLA2R, I think he talked about this and there was discussion between him and Glossop that we, now we have 90% uh, coverage for the uh, primary membranes. So the story continues. It's the, the science has not stopped uh, there yet. So there are some other new antigens and they, they may have you know, their own um, pluses and minuses but I think the, the point I really want to highlight is that how the discovery of this new antigens and antibodies will lead to, um, um, will help us, the clinicians, to manage the disease. We can, you know, really order like a membranous nephropathy panel, and then we will have some diagnostic and prognostic indication. indication. So some of the, uh, these new uh, antigens are this SEMA or SEMA 3B PCDH7 uh, recently got published with extostosin 1 and 2, NEL1. So th this extostosin 1 and 2 is associated with autoimmune lupus, NEL1 mainly with cancer. Uh, there is some association with uh, SEMA and with the family history and, uh, and on. So, so now we are, I think, really going into deep dive into discovery of the new molecules and hopefully the targeted therapy. So really how we originally uh, thought the membrane is nephropathy as a idiopathic, it's really primary and secondary. And now we are actually going towards the classification which is based on the antigen. So, so the science is changing and how we understand this disease is also changing. In the primary, you, you have 70% PLA2R, um, now we have 10% covered with this DHS uh, D7A um, new antigens, as I mentioned, the NEL1, the EXT1, 2, SEMA, PCDH3. So there, there are, I think, uh, new antigens. Again, this is this covered the small space, but um, I think we need to appreciate the, um, the, the discovery. So really now primary will be become the specific antigen base, because if you have uh, TH, for example, THS7, D, D7A, you know that this is associated with cancer. So you have to do extensive um, cancer history and uh, uh, work up to make sure we are not missing any, any cancer. So this is the new classification. And this, this is the paper which is just published. I think it's, uh, this was in the press, um, this kind of ahead of the, uh, this is e-publication. Uh, and, and, and as you could see that hopefully we will, arrive to this level when you can order like a panel of membranes nephropathy. So you PLA to R, all the other uh, things I mentioned. Um, and I think uh, if I was, I was able to look at uh, 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 this paper and I think recently I, I attended the GN webinar in the, by the Columbia. And I think they highlighted some of these facts as well that uh, PLA to R mostly primary THS D7A 10 to 20% with cancer. Uh, if you have EXT1 and EXT2, 70% autoimmune, NEL1, 30% cancer. Uh, the SEMA3B is a pediatric. Uh, it's predominant in the pediatric population. Um, so we, there are some other candidates, NCAM, this HTRA, which are around the horizon as well. So as you could see that we are now going from one um, antigen antibody now to multiple different uh, targets. And EXT, EX, uh, this one, Extostin, we don't have the antibody yet, but nonetheless, I think hopefully maybe when I give this topic presentation in another year or two, I think we'll probably fill you know, <laughs> this gap I, I kept purposefully um, empty. So um, how are we treating this? I think that's, uh, that's the other aspect. How, um, uh, and then how, so really, if we have made this discovery, how these new target antibodies are going to help us. So classic options, uh, we use cytotoxic drugs plus steroids, either the Ponticelli or mo modified Ponticelli protocol or Dutch protocol, which is really alternating cyclophosphamide with high, very high dose steroids for six months. And uh, 
I describe this as like a very short gun kind of approach. Uh, second choice, if you cannot use the, uh, uh, the, the Ponticelli or the cytotoxic drugs, you go to cyclosporin and, and tacrolimus, so CNI-based regimen. Uh, B-cell depletion, um, which is the rituximab, it's actually taking more and more uh, presence. So uh, we have used the word vitamin R, but I think vitamin R or rituximab is taking a lot of space in, in this disease condition as well. ACTH has uh, some studies, but uh, I think the, it's people are, 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 they like it, but not, uh, not to the point that it's taking a lot of uh, uh, use. So mentor trial, which I think came back in 2019 is, is worth mentioning here because uh, uh, historically we had been treating this, uh, the disease with the, you know, uh, Either Ponticelli or modified Ponticelli. So, how many of you just? How many of you you have used? Uh, uh, I'm sure you know the, the cyclophosphamide versus cyclosporin. Is there any pre, pre, like um, you know you like to use one versus other? Uh, I don't have too many cameras on, but maybe somebody can write in the chat is like your favorite re regimen for for treatment of membranes. So, in this trial. Um, so, what so, they. Uh, Umar, I mean, yeah, before Rexibam came in, and we have been using cyclophosphate, I mean, cyclosporine. Mm -hmm. we have used, yes. Okay. Others, if you want to, anybody wants to say something? Dr. Aga, your experience before uh, uh, widespread use of Rexibam? Um, I've used both, um, but I have actually. Uh, full disclosure, uh, I've been moving more towards a hybrid approach when we get into therapy, I'll, I'll highlight that. But um, the only thing to remember uh, is the last two or three letters in the in the topic that you have. Uh, when, when you're using rituximab for membranes, you have to be patient. It takes a long time for people to respond to rituximab. So a lot of people say, well, my patient has not responded. I gave them rituximab, it's been three months and there's nothing. It won't be, it, it takes a longer, much longer period of time. But I've used both uh, cyclosporin, uh, Prograph and rituximab before and after Mentor. So you're talking about uh, clinical response, proteinuria or uh, the antibody level? Uh, so the, serolo the serologic response, and I'm sure Omar will talk about that. So I don't wanna uh, preempt that, but the serologic response um, predates the clinical response. So when you give somebody rituximab, my experience has been you start seeing serological response in about four to six months, and then six to 12 months is the time window when you start seeing the proteinuria start going, going down. So if you look at uh, Mentor, and Omar is going to talk about it, actually, the graphic is right up, so that's perfect. Um, it was rituximab was non-inferior to cyclosporin at 12 months, but at 24 months, rituximab was superior uh, which is very robust in this trial because the, the trial was designed as a non-inferiority trial. Um, and, and the reason is both ways. A lot of people who were on cyclosporin had relapsed by the time uh, tw 24 months came by, which is very, very frequently seen. And uh, a lot of people who had initially not responded completely to rituximab by 24 months had responded. So uh, the data became very, very robust for rituximab at 24 months. But I'll let Omar take over. Omar take over. Oh, I, I think this is, this, is, this is exactly the point which I wanted to highlight. And that's what I think I paused this. Like, you know, we can have some discussion that, uh, you know, the, this is a, a slowly responding disease. It's not a, a, like, a, you know, the, it's the tortoise. It, you have to treat it and then, you know, wait and see and, um, um, uh, yeah, but and sometimes I, it surprises you. Sometimes it actually respond. Luckily, luckily, recently I have seen many patients they respond pretty very right away almost. So, uh, can you say that again? I couldn't hear you. Uh, yeah, in uh, some time, actually, uh, many times it respond pretty quickly. Uh, serologically also and clinically also. I mean, I have- Yeah, so, you know, the, the hypothesis in those circumstances is that perhaps the disease was already on its way to remission. And, um, and so maybe your drug didn't have much to do with what was going on. And that's the treachery of this disease. As we all know, who have practiced in the pre-rituximab age, 
uh, and uh, and the pre-cyclosporin age uh, is that uh, the uh, aphorism was that 30% of membranous relapse uh, remits on its own, 30% stays the same and does nothing, and 30% progresses to end-stage kidney disease. And at that time, we used to say, and it's very hard to say which 30% is going to do what. But now with the tools that we have, I think we can be fairly precise in describing which patient is going to behave which way. And that's, that's very exciting now that we have this very clear model um, where your testing uh, not only makes you help um, a diagnosis, but it also helps you uh, make prognostic indications and therapeutic indications uh, so that it helps you not only defining what the patient is going to do, but it also helps you which therapy might be best for that particular patient. I uh, fully agree. I think uh, said very nicely and uh, and beautifully. So, so I think in the uh, in the sum, if I summarize, so in our armamentarium, we have a cyclo cyclophosphamide or cytotoxic based uh, regimen. We have CNI, we have rituximab, and then this trial shows the um, at twelve months the rituximab and cyclo. Uh, I mean, was so rituximab was non inferior, but I think really. Um, it panned out at 24 months to be superior. So let's now, I think, focus on since the in the practice right now, we have PLA2R testing available. Has, has anybody success with THSD7A um, testing? Um, any order? Most of our hospitals, uh, the Methodist, I mean, in Dallas, the Methodist system has actually on their labs. Um, both THSD7 and PLA2R by EIA available as a panel. So, so when we so, order for one, the other one comes as a freebie, which is great. <laughs> yeah, I think I tried once um, both and I got the result, but I, whenever I order PLA2R, I only get PLA2R. So uh, my colleagues from Pakistan, can you please comment if, uh, are you able to order the, this test or not? Uh, at SIUT, we have the PLA2R but not the THSD essay. Okay. In Rawalpindi, Islamabad, we only have uh, PLA2R and uh, DHSD7 is probably not available as yet. Yeah, uh, it's the same case with Pakistan. Uh, I mean, with the same case with Lahore yeah, in Punjab. Yeah. That, that's wonderful. I think, and then I can tell you, I have um, just, you know, I manage my patient with PLA2R only, I think. As uh, Dr. Aga mentioned, the, the other one came as a freebie. Um, okay, so so we have, I think, the test which we need to, to do uh, for in Pakistan and in USA now. I think it's previously it was difficult. Now it's so easily available. So what happens? So uh, some of the findings again. I think this uh, we just need to appreciate um, like how they reach to some of the conclusions. So if patients are nephrotic, the PLA two level are high when they the disease is in the remission, the levels are low. If the disease relapses, the level goes up again. So very direct kind of correlation. Um, so the even there was correlation between the PLA2R level and proteinuria as well. So as you could see that, uh, so if the antibody is positive, if patient is nephrotic, antibody is positive, patient in remission, antibody negative, before relapse, antibody goes up. And more the proteinuria, higher the PLA2R level or vice versa. Um, so this is the, on, on y-axis is the patient with positive PLA2R. So patient um, who are, have membranous, they have positive. And when they remit, the, the levels are low level or not, actually this is positive negative. So it's negative, I mean, like really 20% positive. So, so again, I think another good um, guideline. Um, the, the other was that the survival and remission. So if you are PLA2 or negative, you are more likely to stay in remission. But if you, after responding to therapy, develop PLA2 or positivity, you don't stay in the remission too long. Basically, this just tells you that, hey, the, the relapse is coming. Um, the other concept I think we discussed is um, 
the understanding of the uh, immunological remission and biological response or biological remission, which is measured by the proteinuria. So you see the reduction in the antibody level way many months before you see the reduction in proteinuria. So this is, I think, has been um, described if you look on the right side of the, um, um, of the slide. So you see that once the treatment is started, the PLA2R level comes down first, and this is when the treatment is started. And, and once it's gone, it's the Im immunological disease. This is actually, then the proteinuria follows with the gap of few months. Some patients go into partial remission, some remain in complete remission. And this is described as the clinical disease. So now we can actually, we are able to detect the immunological disease activity, despite of having, you know, you, you can have like a very low um, uh, PLA2R level, but the proteinuria still is high. So you can predict which way things will go. So uh, PLA2R is very specific for primary membranes, 100% specific, 80% sensitive. Still, I think they, this is how it's written in the, in the literature. It comes months before proteinuria, low or declining level predict remission. Patient with higher level need prolonged immunosuppression to, to achieve remission. So at six months, you look at the level, the level is not like really down, you know, you just keep going. Positive in nephrotic state, um, declines before decline in proteinuria, absent in remission, returns with relapse, and it's a biomarker in diagnosis and monitoring of the disease activity. So Omar, so, there's a question on the chat. Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I'm not looking at the chat, but yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm picking that up. Uh, I think uh, Ahad asked this question and the question is, is the delayed response of rituximab specific to membranous only? I think, uh, you know, in membranous, we see this phenomenon more pronounced, but if, um, you know, I, I think if I extrapolate, I think if you compare uh, rituximab with, for example, cyclophosphamide, I would imagine that cyclophosphamide will show you the response maybe quicker than the rituximab. But in this condition, you know, this has been uh, the case. I don't know. I mean, like, I don't think there has been a comparison done head to head. I'm just trying to extrapolate uh, and give you the answer, which um, is not evidence-based. Uh, other experts, you want to comment on this question? Irfan, you want to take yeah, this? Just, uh, no, I agree with what you're saying. So there's actually good data on that. And I'm, sh I'm sure everybody's looked at Starman, which just came out a few months ago. I'm pretty certain you're going to talk about that. So uh, there's two things. The first is the pathophysiologic model of the disease itself. So you have to imagine that these uh, antigen antibody complexes are sitting in the sub photocyte space. Um, so they're sitting underneath the podocyte on the outer realm, uh, on the outer aspect of the glomerular basement membrane. That's where they're located. So in order for the podocyte to heal, what needs to happen is for the antibody to stop getting into the circulation so that there's a decrease in the formation of the antigen and antibody complexes, a decrease in the complement mediated injury that is happening to the podocyte. Um, and so once you take the, take the antibody production away, it will take a few months. So even when you give them Ponticelli, which decreases antibodies as a serologic remission in Ponticelli is much faster um, than uh, in, 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 than in uh, rituximab. Um, so rituximab definitely takes its time even producing a serologic remission. So when you compare a Ponticelli response curve to a rituximab response curve, the Ponticelli response curve is faster. Um, but it still takes a few months. Now, if you compare that to other glomerular diseases or, you know, for instance, proliferative diseases where there's inflammation, so the classic example I use to illustrate is the difference between class four and class five lupus. When you have class four lupus, you can have severe acute kidney injury. You give them a steroid pulse and start them on cyclophosphamide and the creatinine will go down from four to two in four weeks. 
But when you have got class five lupus, it takes several months for that proteinuria to go away. So the, the disease paradigm is the same. The only thing that makes a difference is how robustly and quickly you kill the cells that are making antibody. So, uh, but so it, this is this is not just a rituximab effect in in um, membranous. It's a class effect. Um, I think the fastest response that you see is to calcineurin inhibitors actually, and uh, the reason that is happening is perhaps because of the vasoconstriction that comes with it. Thank you. I think I think you nailed it very well. So, so some of the other um, I think we'll keep moving. Um, so we discussed about the curves. Um, so I think this graph and this cartoon is um, kind of you know have a part B attached. So you we, I show you the level of antibody followed by the clinical response in proteinuria, which is green. Patients are in remission now relapse. So in the relapse, you see that the antibody level goes up first and then proteinuria is a little delayed and later, which is, you know, just imagine when first the immunity, immunological responses started, and then you see the, the cell damage. And, and I think here, this, there's the, the, this area shows some recovery of the, um, uh, the, the, the filtration apparatus. And this is, again, some resilience of the filtration apparatus as when you start to see the proteinuria. Now, we get the antibody in the serum, but I, as you know that the um, uh, antigen is also detected in the renal biopsy specimen uh, by the immunofluorescence as well. So you can have some scenario, we, actually there are some scenarios when antibody is positive and you see the antigen on the, um, on the renal biopsy, but there are other scenarios as well when the antigen is there, but there is no antibody or there is still antibody and you, you, do, you don't see kind of the um, uh, antigen staining. So 70% uh, of the patients with primary membranous as we originally described, usually have both antibody and antigen detected on the biopsy. As you know, kidney behaves as a sink similar to liver, you know, it actually absorbs a lot of antibodies. So you, you may see some condition when the antigen is there in the biopsy, but you don't see the antibody in the serum. So it happens 10%. Either this is resolving phase or this is very early when the kidney really behaves as a sink and has absorbed all the antibodies in the tissue and there is nothing in the serum to be detected. Uh, again, I think you can have the antibody goes up first, but you, the antigen you're unable to detect maybe with the current technique, and this is early recurrence. Uh, you will not see a lot of proteinuria in this case. Now you know that if the antibody is coming, next level is proteinuria will follow. So I think this is another um, uh, way to look at this, this disease. And uh, now people will question, what about doing a kidney biopsy? I mean, if you can have uh, a, a nice prediction, then should you be doing kidney biopsy or not? So I think this was, a, 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 again, a publication when the, the Mayo Clinic colleagues really retrospectively looked at their patients. So anybody who has BLA2R tested, anybody who has biopsy that showed membrane. So they kind of went back and rolled back and see if they can come up with, a, with some sort of a recommendation about the biopsy. And if doing a biopsy change any management decision or not. So they found that, you know, anytime they ordered PLA2R, there was like 1300 patients and then um, found that 143 had positive serology, both immunofluorescence and ELISA, because I think that this is the new concept, which is um, now looking at the ELISA levels as well as the immunofluorescence for the antibody level. And I think then they, they look for anybody who has a biopsy and saw if there were some secondary causes and really, I think the final recommendation which they came up with that if you have PLA2R both by ELISA and immunofluorescence, you don't need to do a biopsy. And, and sorry, I think they also added that if patient has all the uh, secondary causes are ruled out, you don't need to do a biopsy. Um, although I think they, they feel that this is uh, retrospective and we need to do a prospective. So. 
if the GFR was more than 60, the, again, the biopsy did not change anything in the management on the long-term prognosis. But I think when the GFR was less than 60, a patient had a, a crescent, some patient also had the diabetic nephropathy. So they were not very comfortable. And in this group, there were some patient with IFTA. So the degree of the chronic damage, then you have to be careful as if you want to do immunosuppression or not. So they were very confident that if your kidney function is preserved, you have both ELISA and immunofluorescence positive, and there's nothing secondary go business going on. You don't need a biopsy. Um, uh, I think uh, some of their recommendation were that um, the mid high titer, which is highly correlated with the pathological diagnosis, the low range positive titers are poorly understood. And I think they, that's where I think they say that get immunofluorescence to verify, but not always practical. Um, under, no, under specific circumstances, as I mentioned, kidney function is okay. Um, uh, if patient, and especially if somebody who has a contraindication to biopsy, say a solitary kidney patient who you have all these things and young patient, you don't find any secondary, you know, the antibody is enough to make the diagnosis and start treatment. Although not perfect, I think path pathology will be missed. Um, and um, in your older population, many patients will have just naturally lower GFR. But nonetheless, I think this was the question that, you know, should we do a kidney biopsy or not? And as you could see that people are trying to answer these questions and these questions will be answered more uh, specifically in the coming years. This was uh, one of the um, uh, algorithm which uh, Dr. Bombach, who is at the, uh, so Andy is at the, um, uh, Columbia, and I think I've shared, discussed some of my patients or membranes with him as well. So he, his fellow actually created this, this um, 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 uh, algorithm that if they have PLA2 are positive, do age appropriate cancer screening. Uh, if they have negative, then you, you know, do more rigorous cancer screening. And I think THS D7A, if they are negative, then you do regular screening, but if they are positive, then you do more rigorous cancer screening, which is another, I think, utility of these antibodies as well. Um, I, I like this, this paper too, which uh, looked at um, the degree of the antibody level. So remember, like I think we used to have mild, moderate and severe disease uh, classification in the past and mild, you, you, you know that it's gonna partially or it, it will go to spontaneous remission and moderate and severe is like, you know, there were recommendation about the treatment. And I think now in this study, it will put, put those antibody levels in some sort of a more kind of numbers. And these numbers, uh, 41 to 175, these are the ELISA numbers. So uh, 176 to 610, more than 610. So these are the patient with severe diseases. And these are the antibody for the immunofluorescence. So the, um, uh, the titer of one is to 10 to one is to 32 more is to one is to 100. And, and I think uh, they did not differentiate uh, into this. Maybe there was some, some other factor going on. But the point was that if you have low antibody titer, the chances of spontaneous remission are high as compared to when you have high antibody titer, this patient is not going to spontaneously remit. So you are better off starting this patient with treatment, even when you do the biopsy and make the diagnosis. So, so, so imagine, I think if somebody is, uh, the proteinuria is only like 3.5 grams and then less than four gram and they, they don't have any other risk factors like classic understanding of the mild disease, but their PLA2R level is very, very high. You don't have to wait for a few months before you start the treatment and vice versa. You may see somebody who's very severely nephrotic and you see that their antibody level is not kind of very high and then you do maybe another repeat level in a month's time. And it's, if it is going down, you can think this patient may go into spontaneous remission and uh, you want to wait. Uh, Dr. Aga, you want to say something? I know you. Uh, th this is a, a topic of your uh, favorite uh, um, liking as well. You want to comment anyway, on this? I, I, I think you were very precise. Um, you know, we all haggle on what's low and intermediate and high, but um, I, I, I think that's very precise. And... Um, so, you know, when we were talking about those wait times with membranous where, you know, the teaching was, the classic teaching was we get somebody with membranous, you wait six months before you do anything. 
Um, so you look at the, the PLA2 antibody titer, and if it's 400, that ain't going in, go, go anywhere. You don't need to wait, you can start treating. On the other hand, if you've got you know, nephrotic syndrome and a PLA2R antibody level of 40, you may want to wait because that's the one uh, advance that's going to go away very, very quickly with rituximab and we'll be patting our, ourselves on our backs that we did it, but it was that the disease was going to remit anyways and it was, in, was on its way to serologic remission. It happened to me like two months ago, I had a THSD7 antibody nephrotic syndrome, young lady nephrotic syndrome six months in, and so I was all, you know, getting ready to give her rituximab. And um, a week before the infusion, proteinuria went from like eight grams to four grams. So I held off. Uh, and uh, four weeks later, she's in full remission without doing anything at all. If I had not seen that, and that was serendipitous that we had at that lab done a week before the infusion, if I had not seen that, I would have given her the rituximab, and then I'd be very proud of myself that I treated her and she's in remission. She was going to go into remission anyways. So these diseases are sometimes treacherous. So Omar, I have a question. Uh, if uh, APLA2 the level is very high, but kidney function is still like stable or normal. Uh, will you go ahead and start treatment or you will wait in that case? Yes, I, I, I think I'd be, I would not look at the kidney function. Actually, I'm happy that kidney function is stable so this patient can weather the storm of the uh, wrath of the immunosuppression. So I would look for the antibody level and the, you know, the proteinuria is the biological marker. Of course, you know, you, you want to consider, but a kidney function, normal creatinine, actually that's the ideal patient. And most of my patients who I treated, I think they, um, their kidney function was normal. And I, I, I don't think I looked at the creatinine if that was the question. So you think that the kidney function has anything to do with the patient at high risk, very high risk? to the two years or that is not important? So I think then the next next thing which, um, so if the kidney function is low, GFR is below, then the kidney biopsy will give some prognostic indication to see how much chronic damage is on the kidney biopsy. And I think that will be a consideration. But nonetheless, I think if somebody has antibody levels, they're nephrotic, they're in, they're, they're biological and immunological presence of disease, I would chase that. Um, and I think the, the decision making is if somebody has you know, GFR is, is, is already kind of in 30s, 40s, and then now uh, they have, we found this. So then please don't give them CNI, give them um, rituximab. I think this, this is the other, other beauty of this drug is like, you know, you can use it into advanced disease. Let, let me let me make a point here, uh, Omar. So um, I, I generally agree with what you're saying, but let's kind of highlight why it is in membranous that looking at kidney function is very, very important. So VAS does bring forward a very important point which needs to be appreciated from a pathophysiological standpoint. For diseases of the podocytes, a loss in kidney function has a very different connotation um, than diseases of the endothelial cells. So if you've got lupus and the creatinine is five and they've got you know an explosion going on in the kidney, who cares, you just give them um, steroids and give them cyclophosphamide or give them MMF and their, their kidney function will get better. On the other hand, when you're talking about diseases of the podocytes, um, there's only a fixed number of podocytes that we have in a glomerulus. So once you lose 40% of your glomerular population and each glomerulus has about 600 to 800 podocytes, you lose 40% of those, you're at the point of no return. After that, no matter what you do, you're going to develop a secondary focal sclerotic process and the kidney will go down. So a connotation of a creatinine of two and a half and a GFR of 35 in a membranous guy is very different than um, a GFR of 35, acutely dropped GFR of 35 in, in a proliferative disease process. So loss of kidney function in membranous is a late phenomenon. It doesn't, it doesn't present with it. Sometimes when you've got severe nephrosis, you can have an ATN because of uh, various reasons. But due to glomerular disease, loss of GFR is a late phenomenon in membranous. And when it happens, it unfortunately is a really bad prognostic factor. So now the corollary for that is, let's suppose you've got somebody with membranous who has got a GFR of 30, right? And uh, 10 grams of protein. And you decide, I'm going to treat them. Um, you obviously won't 
probably use a calcineurin inhibitor. Uh, if you use rituximab, you're going to wait a year, year and a half for the response to come up, if at all, because there may be secondary focal sclerotic changes there. So that's where the biopsy. So one of the corollaries that Umar was saying that you don't need to do a biopsy in PLA2Rs, you always have to do a biopsy if the GFR is low. So that, that assumption that this is a PLA2R related process, you can get by without doing a biopsy if the GFR is normal. But if the GFR is 40, if the GFR is 50, I would, ab well not 50, but if it's 40, if it's 30, I would absolutely do a biopsy to make certain that there's enough left in that kidney to salvage. And so the provocative question here is, would you at that point, let's suppose somebody's got a GFR of 30 and they've got nephrotic syndrome and they've got 30 or 40% IFTA, which is the usual case when you've got a GFR of 30 to 40. In that case, is it wise to give rituximab or is it wise to give cyclophosphamide using the Ponticelli to get a faster remission and get the kidney out of the fire faster so that um, you have something left to protect. And that's a very style dependent thing. Um, and it also is dependent on how comfortable you are doing Ponticelli. I know of a lot of my colleagues who try to reason themselves out of Ponticelli because they're not comfortable doing Ponticelli. It's much easier to give one dose of rituximab and then let things fly. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll let you take a rumor. So, I, I would not go with Ponticelli, but I would that patient who has a creatinine going up and has very high risk for risk for deteriorating. I would use cyclophosphamide on that patient. Yeah, and I think uh, uh, no, I, I did mention the biopsy here. I think whenever you are uh, because current management we have really based we, we have biopsy in most of the patients in the in the current form and shape. And biopsy gives you a lot of prognostic information. Um, I think I fully agree with your comments, uh, Dr. Aha, and um, uh, coming back to a style question, if my friend was here, uh, I don't see how long is he here today? Nope. So, you know, there's some people that are going to go with the, um, the either or. So, so moving uh, forward, there was another treatment algorithm um, kind of, you know, some sort of a guidance that you start, once you start the immunosuppression, you follow the PLA2R level bi-monthly and their recommendation was bi-monthly. If you see a very rapid decline, more than 90% reduction in the antibody level, less than six months, you can actually stop the immunosuppression um, sooner than the six months. Um, if you don't see any response or less than, um, so no response at six months. So you, you modify, you switch your regimen. And if you see a slow response at six months, you continue the immunosuppression. So this, this was one of the recommendations from a different paper as well. And they've gone through um, their, their basis, but I think this was one of their final recommendation. Um, and I think we are trying to highlight the same point that now you can use antibody to guide your therapy. It's, it's kind of your new GPS. Um, a case uh, which I would like to discuss, um, a tough case, tough to treat. So 47 male who came with four months history of progressive NSR nephrotic syndrome, biopsy showed membranous, workup was negative and patient had a, a very high titer, one is to 5120. So this is how his proteinuria was, um, six gram, um, at that time, you know, we, the, there was some conservative treatment, um, but protein urea worsened. And believe me or not, I, I think I just want you to, uh, uh, un, like, I mean, I, I mean, I never accepted the fact this patient was treated with prednisone alone, not uh, with Ponticelli or not with rituximab or not with anything else. So it, he was given prednisone for a brief period of time before, you know, um, like I said, when we got the level done and then I asked for the rituximab. So he had some improvement in the proteinuria, but then his proteinuria started to, so it came down from 14 to like seven. And then I think subsequently uh, it went up. So we repeated the antibody level. So it was 51, one is to 5,100, then it came down to one is to 2560. We kept going 
uh, proteinuria kind of mode, like very high. And then uh, three months after rituximab, his uh, PLA2R level came as one is to 160 and one is to 180. The one is to 80, so it was kind of on the downward trend. So the question was what to do. Uh, at, should we um, give him another dose of rituximab or keep waiting? Um, or should we just go to um, cyclophosphamide? So um, I think we, we ended up checking his CD19 level at four month time and, and it just confirmed that uh, the rituximab he originally received was effective. So at that point, what would you do? Would you give him um, something different because he still has 10 grams of protein or LM, he was he's still nephrotic or you will continue to wait and this is four months. And I think the, the discussion we had have had is in a, I would just summarize, we actually want decided to wait. So this patient um, um, afterwards, after the month six, his proteinuria went down to less than three grams and he clinically started to feel better. And then he remained into that uh, partial remission for almost a year time when we saw that his antibody level is going up again. And, and it was, I, I did not add this to the, to the slide, but his uh, recent his antibody level has gone up to again, kind of the previous range. And then um, then we, we started seeing, you know, once we have the high antibody level, his protein area was also, there was a trending up. So we this time gave him um, cyclophosphamide. And I think he has shown a very quick response this time as compared to the slow response with the rituximab. So um, hope I will, so once we see what, what happens, I think I probably will add, add the slide um, to see what's the final outcome. But again, some of these patients can respond very quickly and some sometimes the disease is very stubborn. And I think in, in the retrospect, I realized that his antibody level was extremely elevated. Maybe we should have um, um, given him the cytotoxic therapies to begin with um, um, rather than the rituximab. So um, any comments, uh, Dr. Aga? Yeah, sure. There's, there's actually good data on that. There's a couple of papers on this. When your PLA2 or antibody is this high to begin with, there's about a 30 to 40% primary non-response rate to rituximab. So you were lucky that you saw some response there. And I think the quickness also is that he got a bunch of steroids, you know, right before you dosed him the rituximab. It's not that steroids won't work in membranous, they would work, but at great cost and with a very high relapse rate when used alone. So, um, um, so yeah, my, my only critique in this is if I had looked at this person with very heavy nephrotic uh, syndrome with a PLA2R antibody. Uh, I think that's an indirect immunofluorescence. So this must have been a few years ago at 125120 to begin with. I, I probably would have treated him with Ponticelli and not with rituximab. But I think what you did worked. Um, you know, he responded a little bit slowly. And then when he relapsed, you did the right thing and put the disease back in its box. So you know, there's various different ways to skin a cat, but I would have opened with Ponticelli in this case. Yeah, this is a, our, I mean, we, we do the same thing. If some patient present with very aggressive disease, very heavy protein urea, particularly if the gradient is rising, mm -hmm. then we go directly to cyclophosphamide. Yeah, I, I, to be, you know, I, I agree with one thing that you said, Wes, that is the high levels of PLA2R. The second thing, the degree of proteinuria, I sometimes don't let that guide me because you can have very high degrees of proteinuria with a modest level of PLA2 or antibody, which responds, responds just as well to, to non-cyclophosphamide based therapy. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, but, but, the, but the pattern is correct, yeah. Some, some patient with a massive proteinuria, if they develop secondary ATN, sometimes doesn't recover from that ATN. Yeah. The, yes, I'm having a little bit of a hard time understanding you. Can you get close to the mic, please? Yeah, I have some problem with mic. Okay, so I have some patients who have very heavy protein urea, like 20 gram or 25 grams. And if they develop ATN from that, that ATN does not recover. They don't recover from that ATN. And they end up, in, uh, end up in dialysis. So that's my worry, is that if you treat something yeah, very aggressively, uh, then we might save their treatment. I 100% agree. In that circumstance, I would probably want to be aggressive as well. Yes, you're right. 
Um, um, anybody else wants to say something? I, I have a question. You present your your I, uh, can, bad can cases ask, to to learn. Can I can I ask a question to Dr. Irfan? Uh, Pakistan, uh, we 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 do not have. Uh, uh, companies manufacturing cyclocrosses. Oh, so, Mayor, first and foremost, I'm still Irfan to you, so you should you should call me Irfan and not Doctor Irfan. That's <laughs> but, very formal. Uh, great, great, great to so, talk so to people, you, Irfan. People who don't know, Sarumair was uh, from the sixth batch of Army Medical College. I'm from the tenth batch, so I'm quite a quite a bit junior to him. So, um, we'll no, no, no. Your uh, your yeah. your your expertise in nephrology is uh, highly. Uh, commendable uh, my my uh, my query is uh, regarding the uh, use of uh, cyclophosphamide uh, in pakistan we we do not get uh, a lot of oral cyclophosphamide because it is not uh, indigenously uh, produced it's usually smuggled from india can can we, we use uh, injectable uh, cyclophosphamide uh, in any uh, regime that you know uh, in, uh, rather than Ponticelli, modified Ponticelli? Irfan, the question is for you. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, absolutely. So, there's data on both using IV cyclophosphamide. So, if you want to use IV cyclophosphamide, so the Dutch protocol is, um, so if you want to use non-Ponticelli type regimens, you can use the Dutch protocol, which is oral, or you can use IV monthly cyclophosphamide just as you would for, for instance, lupus. And there's several studies that, that, that have looked at that. And as long as you're dosing the cyclophosphamide adequately, it should do the same thing. Yeah, I agree. Thank I think you. There... Go ahead. Somebody else was talking. I'm sorry, I uh, just interrupted. Oh, please, Baat Kari. I just wanted to thank Irfan. Over to you, Umar. Shukriya. So, um, I think the... Please, um, Can I ask a question? Please. This is Dr. Noman Tarif. G. Noman. My question is, you know, recently other antigens have been described also. Is it possible that uh, while we are treating the PLA2R with uh, rituximab, these other antigens coexist? Has it been shown? So we need, you know, like cyclophosphamide for the other antigen. It doesn't uh, behave the same way as with the tuximab. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we we know the answer to your question yet. Um, I think the the others are not too much in the clinical use, um, and I, I don't think there are a lot of trials by by focusing on those antigens uh, and see the response. Although I show you a case series with the THS, you know, we'll probably have those, and then. Um, there was a cyclosporin study. So, Irfan, are you aware of any any of the study which has looked, uh, which has targeted or chased the other antigens? No, uh, you know, THSD7, there's a bunch of case series, actually, some of them you showed, and they, it, it appears as this THSD7 disease um, acts as uh, PLA2R light. It's actually easier to treat roughly and responds better. Um, uh, as far as NEL1 uh, associated disease or SEMA 3B and all that, they're just, you know, two cases, three cases, handful of cases. And most of these, the Mayo group are publishing one antigen every three months now because they're, they're doing LCMS and uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, I think they're good with this method. So, uh, they're so just they describe the method very well too. So what that eventually settles out to is hard to say. Um, and uh, exostosin 1, exostosin 2 type disease is almost exclusively seen as a subgroup of autoimmune secondary uh, membranous. And it actually confers um, a beneficial effect. So prognosis in exostosin 1, exostosin 2 positive lupus nephritis, for instance, is better than if you don't have those antigens. So, so I think since we are talking about the aggressiveness of therapy and um, um, the dose, high dose versus low dose response. Um, so there was, I think a trial, even uh, looking at the two rituximab uh, 
based regimen. So one was um, the one gram every two weeks and one the other one was the 375 milligram per meter square um, Q week times two. So this was Q weeks time two. I think one was the high dose and one was the lower cumulative dose. So this one, you saw the remission in six months, 64%, and the remission in six months was 30%. It took three months with this dose to achieve remission as compared to nine months. And I think the, the levels of the uh, CD19 were listed. It, it just looked at the higher dose uh, led to more complete depletion of B cell and higher rate of remission and early remission. Uh, again, I think, um, I don't think this was a, a very, um, uh, I have not, I have used the high dose, uh, it's easy. Um, uh, but I think this was one of the study which was interesting at that time too. So um, I will, this is, I think my last slide. Uh, and then I think I will ask Dr. Agha if he has energy to present his case. If not, then we can rest the, uh, our afternoon. So uh, summary for suggested use of anti-PLA2R and I kind of recently uh, learned from the, the webinar as well, that uh, if you have a patient, uh, if you have, if possible, every member in this patient should have anti-PLA2R assessed in biopsy and the serum. So uh, if possible, at least, you know, serum is important. If PLA2R is negative, um, look for secondary causes, but it, because, you know, we know there's idiopathic uh, can happen as well, but at least, you know, you, you have to go for secondary causes more aggressively. For patient who have uh, the antigen on the biopsy, if the antibody is negative or low titer, it's, will tell you that they will achieve remission soon. If the antibody level is high, so it's lower likelihood of remission. So this is the, this is the prime case. You really don't have to wait, 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 six months. You, you can start treatment soon. You can follow the serial levels of antibody in the serum monthly if possible, I think the recommendation, but bi-monthly in other studies as suggested to help guide the decision. If the, Titer is stable or falling, watch for spontaneous remission. I think we discussed that. If there is a writing, rising titer, initiate immunosuppression. And I think the, the point we discussed was if very high titer, please go with the cytotoxic therapies like cyclophosphamide-based re regimen. Um, checking the antibody during the treatment is useful um, uh, to see it, like when you reach to six months to see you know who's gonna, uh, remit and who will not. Um, and then assessing the level at the end of immunosuppression treatment may be useful in assessing likelihood of maintaining remission. I think we kind of proved that, that if you keep looking at it, and I have a patient who I was doing every three months after he was in remission, and then we were able to catch or relapse and started him on something and he quickly responded. Um, I did not touch the transplant, uh, but the if somebody who has pre-transplant high titers. So they are at risk of recurrent disease in the allograph and um, you know, then you need to do post-transplant surveillance as well. So that this, this has been, I mean, I kept it maybe for a different day. So I will stop here. Um, next section is next month. I think Dr. Mateen will talk about IG nephropathy and maybe I can unshare and then we go into discussion mode and see if Dr. Aga has um, stamina. To... Can I ask you one quick question here? I mean, that is just something you just said. So, patient on, uh, can you hear me, guys? Yes, go ahead. So, I think is, I have asked this question before. Uh, so, if patient is on dialysis, waiting for transplant, uh, and titer is high, I mean, does it make sense to give him a reduction at that time or to decrease the title or we should not? Just hang in there because as luck would have it, um, I, I have prepared my cases from a transplant recurrent standpoint. So we'll just discuss that momentarily. So perfect time to ask that question. Great. Thank, thank you for saving me some grace too. All right, very good. So let me share my screen.
right, can you guys see my um, title screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'll be, I'll be really um, quick and breezy through this. So um, uh, thank you, Umar, for a very, very comprehensive exposition on membranous. It kind of covers uh, most of the things that any practicing clinician needs to know about membranous. So segueing into Aves's question about how to deal with membranous nephropathy and transplantation. So when we see somebody who's got a diagnosis of membranous or who's coming in for a transplant evaluation, um, we ask, what is the risk of recurrence for that particular patient and which patient is at risk? Um, how to monitor this disease post-transplant, uh, how to treat it, and are there different forms of membranous nephropathy after transplantation? So traditionally, we've been told that 15 to 20% of membranous recurs in transplantation, but these are old registry data. Um, so we can now tease it out, and it is easy, uh, not easy, but more... Um, um, scientific to, to tease out what an individual patient's risk is. And then we have tools now with the PLA2R antibody because that's the commonest bucket, the biggest bucket of membranous that we deal with. We can take care of this uh, post-transplant and treatment and um, management after transplantation is getting more settled. So there are two flavors of membranous nephropathy after transplantation. One is the commoner, recurrent membranous nephropathy. So all the patients that we were talking about who got PLA2R related disease can recur after transplantation. Uh, and so you've got the very classic uh, anti-PLA2R antibody, which is an IgG4 antibody, as Omer mentioned. Um, and the thing about IgG4 antibodies is that these are deficient of, uh, of, of some galactose residues at, at their hinge region. And so they're not very good at uh, fixing complement. Um, and so uh, through the classical pathway. So they fix complement through the lectin pathway as well as some alternate pathway activity. But in any case, they get in and they um, attach with the podocyte antigen and the antigen antibody complex then falls in the subpodocyte space. And then the disease starts just as it would in the um, native kidney. On the other hand, there are cases of de novo membranous nephropathy and we need to kind of get uh, a little, um, um, alerted to the possibility that this may be um, a de novo type of disease and not primary disease um, because the IgG in these cases is usually an IgG1 instead of an IgG4. And these disease, this disease is variably related uh, to certain viral infections, HBV, HCV, um, some cancers, uh, and more importantly, antibody-mediated rejection. So over here, you have this cartoon of membranous, but when you um, stain it for um, C4D, it lights up everywhere in the peritubular capillaries. So um, two flavors, but the commonest is, is um, PLA2 or antibody, and recurrence is a more common and more uh, studied phenomenon. So Here's the case. Uh, this is a young African-American female. She had membranous nephropathy with very aggressive course, led to end-stage kidney disease after failure to respond to cyclophosphamide. She was on renal replacement therapy for about a year prior to transplant. She transplanted. Um, PLA2 antibody at the time uh, is very high at the time of transplant and the level by the indirect immunofluorescence assay is greater than one to 2560. So here's Ovas's question here. What would you do? How would you treat this patient going into transplant? So how many would give her rituximab at this point? How many would watch her? How many would say, go back, get treated, and come back? Because that is one of the opinions that this patient got. So there's different ways to look at this. Um, so three things are do what you're doing and wait for recurrence and react to it if it recurs. Give her rituximab now as part of induction or send her back, have her treated and then treat, transplant her when the pla 2 r antibody is low. Who would go for what? 
any takers? Uh, what kind of induction therapy will she receive? She is going will to that matter? Thymoglobulin. She is going to get thymoglobulin. Thymoglobulin followed by followed by prograf, my for, um, mycophenolic acid, and prednisone. So won't that be enough to at least uh, you know suppress some of these immunosuppression? I mean, immunity and decrease the amount of PLA2R. So that is certainly a very reasonable viewpoint that we are going to assess this disease now in an alloimmune environment where there's a lot of immunosuppression on board and perhaps the course of the disease is going to be different um, because the same immunosuppression that is going to look after the alloimmune response may also destroy this essentially autoimmune phenomenon of membranous. So that is certainly a reasonable way, but uh, Avas is worried that the PLA2R antibody is so high that she may have an immediate recurrence. So he wants to give rituximab, I think. Avas, is that right or am I? No, am I, I, said, uh, I mean, I have not given, actually, I have not seen a patient with this high titer so far. Mm -hmm. I mean, titer is a little bit low, I probably will just ignore it. Okay, but this titer high, I would just call my friend uh, in Houston. I mean, sorry, Dallas, <laughs> ask him his opinion. Uh, so I really need really to run. What should I do? I luckily didn't have any patient with this high titer. Okay, anybody else with any ideas? As uh, we were discussing, rituximab uh, is uh, uh, a, a drug which shows a very late uh, response mm -hmm. in uh, uh, native kidneys. So I believe uh, it would be too long before any meaningful response is seen uh, and the patient has to wait uh, a long period of time for, her, for his or her transplant. That's an excellent observation, uh, Sarumar, and I will expound on that a little bit because the thing that is different in a transplanted kidney is that you have the head start. So when we see membranous presenting clinically, they actually developed the disease six or nine months ago. The antibody levels started going up, then they started develop, depositing the antibody in the subphotocyte space, then the, the photocytes started getting injured. This is a very slow ramp on disease. So it is after three, four, five months of this activity that the patient actually starts coming to you saying, I've got swelling in my feet. But in the transplant patient, you can actually catch them very, very early because you're watching them like a hawk. So it's a little bit of a different scenario uh, from a ramp on, the stage of ramp on, and I'll make that point. So in the interest of time, let me show you what we actually ended up doing. So we chose not to give her anything um, and we wanted to see what she did. So look what happens to her PLA2R antibody titer. So it was greater than 2560 when we transplanted her. She got thymo, my forte, prograf, prednisone, usual stuff. And her titers dropped very, very significantly. So went down to 320. And in a few months, so she was transplanted in September. So by October, um, her proteinuria started coming up in the, in, in the, in the urine. And at that point, her titer was one to 640. We gave her rituximab and her proteinuria. So see here, the response is really, really fast. So within a month, her proteinuria has gone down from three grams to 1.5 grams. And by February, she's kind of in remission completely. And so the difference here is that you are watching it. So this is her biopsy. You can see that if I showed you this biopsy, most of us are most of us are going to say this is a normal kidney. Only when you tell somebody that she has membranous, you say, ah, maybe the, the capillaries are, are a little thickened. But if you showed me this biopsy, nine times out of ten, I would say this this looks pretty normal. Um, okay. So my slide has 
anyway, so it will probably come back. I'm actually on, on this presentation online. So anyway, so when we looked at her electron microscopy, uh, her, um, um, her um, deposits were minuscule. They were almost hard to see. So they were just in the subepithelial space. There were no intramembranous deposits. Um, and so this is the immunofluorescence on that. You got IgG, you got PSC3. And so these are the deposits I was talking about. So again, let's orientate ourselves. This is the basement membrane. These are the epithelial cells and the foot processes. This is the, um, the capillary lumen here. And what you see is very, very small deposits. So you can almost have to imagine that there are deposits here. So this is the earliest of the early membranous recurrences that you can imagine. And so, um, you know, you can actually make a case to follow the levels and then treat based on a tighter velocity that it was coming down and then the level has persistently started going up. So you know it is coming or you can treat when slight amount of proteinuria comes up. And so this is, this is again, one of our biopsies. I can see these very small deposits in the subphotocyte space. So this is another case though, which kind of highlights the flip side of not giving the rituximab. This is a 60 something year old guy, again, PLA2R positive, um, membranous, uh, very high PLA2R antibody titer at the time of transplant. So this is EIAs. So he had 164 RU per ml um, at the time of transplant. Again, we did nothing, we just watched him. And so his antibody, so this is a portneuria, which went down and remained down and has remained down since his transplant. And his PLA2R antibody has gone down and it's kind of now in the insignificant range. So this is what Dr. Tarif was saying that, um, what if your immunosuppression takes care of the disease itself? So the assessment of this disease in the LO immune environment is different compared to in the native environment um, from with, with two aspects. One is you've got a leg up as far as the time is concerned, time to onset, and therefore the response is going to be fast and you should act pretty quickly when membranous recurs because the sooner you treat, the easier it is to treat it and the li greater likelihood that you would get a response. And also there would be many patients where you can just follow the level. So if we were doing this patient and the level was coming down nicely, but then over here started going up like this, then we know that there will be a clinical recurrence soon, and I might actually give her uh, give him a jab of um, rituximab at that time. But this is kind of, I think, how most people are beginning to look at rituximab in the um, in the modern era with PLA2R available. This is a little bit of an unknown animal at this time, and we're still trying to figure out what is the best way. It seems to respond to rituximab as well. And unlike in the native kidney <clears throat> environment, um, in the transplant environment, um, response to rituximab is pretty good in these patients. So I'll stop there, and if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Omar is on as well, so I'll hand, him back to, uh, hand this back to Omar. No, thank you. I think this is uh, this is great. I, I just, um, you know, we, we all have been managing patients for now several years. And just imagine 10 years ago, we did not have these things in the, um, you know, we, we we had no clue. You just kind of, you know, you just have to just target shoot six months, one year, and then see. I think it, it's fascinating how this has changed um, the management. And I think we have more Fine. things here. Sorry, can I ask a question again? I'm sorry, the fellow called me a very long time. I was looking for your talk. So first case you described, I actually missed that. So with very high titer, you gave reduction before transplant. Is that right? Let, let me pull up the presentation yeah, again. Yeah, no worries. Let me pull it up. Just one second. Yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I just had to attend that phone call a very long time. So this is the first patient. Yes. Uh, very high PLA2R antibody at the start. Um, we just gave regular induction and standard uh, sequential immunosuppression. And um, a few months after transplantation, her proteinuria went up. We biopsied her at that time. 
uh, and gave her rituximab and she had a fairly quick response. The second patient, pretty similar clinical in the sense that had PLA2R antibody detectable, detectable in blood. We again gave him nothing, just the regular immunosuppression, and he went into remission both serologically and clinically. So uh, the, the, the thing I think to do is in these patients who have a very high PLA2R antibody level at the start when you're transplanting them, one needs to monitor very closely for the level of the antibody as well as proteinuria. And if you see that the antibody is coming down nicely and native proteinuria has gone away and there's no new proteinuria, just monitor. But if you see tighter velocity in the PLA2 or antibody level that the level is going up or proteinuria develops, then you should biopsy. And in this particular case, very, very early membranous. This is the first case. And the response is fast and quick in these patients because you don't have very entrenched disease here. So what this basement membrane has to do to heal is much less than somebody who presented with membranous in the native environment where they had three, four, five, six months of disease activity to happen before they present with clinical nephrotic syndrome. So here we are not letting nephrotic syndrome or extensive damage to the membrane happen. We are picking it up when they've got 500 milligrams or a gram of protein and treating or treating it right then, but you would not give rituximab before transplant. No, you? none. Both of these cases were not given rituximab before transplant. We followed titers of the antibody levels of the antibody, and then respond to either an increasing level or proteinuria. Thank you. So there so, was one more question. Can I? Can I just? Uh, yeah. Can I just ask a, a observation? I would say. Does it not suggest that we should be using more of a multi-targeted therapy and just keep the rituximab as a, you know, uh, rescue in our native membranous patients? Yeah, that's the. the um, um, I'll I'll jump in. I'm, I'm sorry. I, uh, I'm, if the question is directed towards me, and I think that's a very very interesting uh, observation because the paradigm of membranous is a little bit more complicated than just a bunch of B cells making antibody. Um, and so there's multi -le multiple levels of uh, T and B interactions. And it appears that part, at least part of the action of rituximab is not related to B cell depletion. It may be local protocyte action. It may be T and B cell interaction, which helps. And I think the closest paradigm to this is lupus where we have learned from the transplant environment and now multipoint therapy is becoming standard of care or um, 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 is, is becoming, um, uh, people are adapting it more and more frequently because that seems to work much better for lupus. But that study has not been done yet in the native world. Uh, Salaam alaikum, uh, This is Adil. Uh, regarding the first case, uh, post uh, your ca case with very high anti PLA2 titers, is this a practice uh, type thing which this, or is this based on any solid data? Because uh, on reading one of the AST discussion forums, which you are, and me are there, so a few of them suggested for such high titers to give rituximab pre-transplant. That's, that's, that's actually, most of that comes from Dr. Rodby from Chicago, who obviously has his view on this. But in the transplant world, it's not mainstream, but there's, you know, different people will uh, do this differently. Um, I'm trying to um, condense what the consensus of opinion seems to be. Yeah, I think it's Thank again, you. uncharted territory. It's uh, something new. And um, uh, uh, if I were to see this patient in the transplant, I would have done something similar that no pre-transplant rituximab, just, just monitor the titer and then decide. Um, so the two questions I think on one is from Dr. Mufti. And then I will ask the, the one question was when you 
cave detects him at on top of, so was this on top of the existing immunosuppression without any change in the treatment? The second is, how often were you checking the uh, PLA2R level in this transplant patient? Yeah, it was, it was on top of the existing immunosuppression and I check PLA2Rs monthly after transplant. Thank you. Um, I, I think, again, uh, it, it, I would, I'm interesting, interested in knowing uh, the experience in Pakistan. So uh, somebody wants to share um, their case, their best practices. Um, Pakistan may zara thoda sa guide karein ke aap log kaise isko manage kar rahe aur uh, what are the challenges? I can just, um, what I can uh, say is that, you know, in Pakistan, the NTPLA2R has been recently introduced, uh, the levels. So it was not possible to get it done. You know, now uh, Aha Khan is doing it. Uh, Shokat Khan is still struggling to, uh, to establish and uh, some other labs are also. So uh, like Shafa, they have already done it for the last uh, year or so. So I think uh, it does help some of these cases uh, where uh, we were stuck uh, after uh, giving them, you know, uh, the cyclosporin or tacrolimus uh, with steroids and still the protein urea persists. Then, uh, you know, we got the level and the level was high and gave the rituximab and it did work. So uh, now I think the experience will be there more after probably uh, two years or so from now. But uh, maybe SAUT, since they had been doing it even before, maybe they can shed some light more in this case. <coughs> Ali, you want to go? Yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I think we, uh, I cannot recall any, because I uh, mainly involved with children and I cannot recall any patient recently that we have done uh, transplant on uh, with membranous. Uh, we've been doing PLA2R for a couple of years now, but um, there are very few patients with the membranous who would go into ESRD and uh, go for immediate transplant. The usual course is that, you know, they um, uh, they, after the receiving the treatment, they stay on dialysis for some time. And um, we've seen that with all these autoimmune diseases, when they stay on dialysis, the activity of all these autoimmune diseases uh, is, uh, automatically goes low. Probably it burns out the kidney and... I, I, I'm sorry, we do not have any specific experience of this, similar to what Dr. Aga presented. Adil, anything from the VKLI? Yes, because of the cost factor, we have given about, uh, I think about six to seven patients. Rituximab, they were all affording patients. And uh, the, we are getting, as Dr. Uh, Noman said, I'm using mainly IDC lab for checking and they don't have ELISA, so we are using this RIU. And uh, the rest of the patients are mainly uh, on cyclophosphamide and very few. After the mentor trial, we are usually uh, using the CNIs as a second line of drugs. So mainly cyclophosphamide and uh, to a less stain for the affording patients because we have rituximab also from the institution also we have limited uh, supply of rituximab. So in some patients we are using, but not in a, in a resistant case from the, as a starting point. Thank you. Um, uh, if, you if, if, uh, yeah, so, 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 um, so, so my experience, uh, in my humble opinion, the thing is that the differences between practices between the US and Pakistan is twofold. One is the availability of these antibodies. The antibodies, even PLAR2, as Dr. Numan Tarif has said, is recently, you know, even in Lahore, I think only IDC is probably doing it as for us. Um, so it's pretty new still for us. The second thing is that Sorry, maybe uh, I am a bit of... Yeah, but, but may, in terms of treatment, maybe I am a bit of a worse. But um, infection is a major problem in Pakistan. And I would, um, I mean, this is just me, and this is not the, the mentor trial speaking. I, I, I can't debate the mentor trial per se, but I don't think it applies too well to the Pakistani population. So if there is a patient 
who's got normal kid uh, who's even got uh, you know my first go to drug would rather be cni in the pakistani population i w- i have seen too many deaths at um, because of cyclophosphamide probably secondary to p- previous tb exposures with got typhoid also sitting somewhere and even um, maybe this is something that we will discuss uh, at some point when we are discussing cmv but in the pakistani population cmv igg comes out to be positive in 99.9% of the patients so we have had i've yet to see a patient who doesn't have cmv igg positivity when we do pre transplant workup so i usually start with cnis and of course if the patient has got decreased renal function so cni cannot be a, uh, the drug uh, go to drug then i would consider cyclophosphamide and um, but those are the two things that i would say is the variable practices as far as us versus pakistan one is the availability of the antibody and the second is infection um your comments on my practices then you know i think the the again the availability of antibody is also a recent phenomenon in U- usa um in the last few years so uh, the from the infection standpoint you know uh, those things are are very important and and that's where i think i have i have heard people uh, say good things and bad things about selcept as well because of the intolerance and side effects and sometimes you know a useful drug cannot be used just because of those uh, problems um but i think some you know so if cyclophosphamide cannot be used you know you have you still have a a good alternative um uh, option cni is one you know if patient can can afford uh, rituximab that's the other option too so so that's not a you know that's still part of the plan anybody else uh, wants to uh, say something ask question just uh, just a comment you know as uh, biopsy is uh, kind of uh, many of the patients are very scared so they refuse biopsy right away and many of these patients you know keep on lingering here and there so in some of these patients uh, recently what i had done is just done the pla2 or antibodies and in fact you know had been able to uh, treat them uh, as an membranous which was not available before and this is you know one of the wonderful thing uh, in our setup because of the reluctance in uh, getting the biopsy done i think ye to badi bada zabardast baat hai ye to this is a very good outcome from from this ke aap you can avoid kidney biopsy in an unwilling patient to begin with um i think fir to zyada se zyada ye test jo hai na wo karna chahiye aapko yes it costs somewhere around 4200 uh, from aa khan but i think if i'm not wrong you know idc also sends it to aa khan itself and there are very consistent results yeah i id charges uh, 6000 but that is i think yeah, but they are sending uh, it to aga khan yeah but they are sending it to aga khan uh, professor naman is right yeah yeah ahad because it, when we met last time in pakistan and i i don't think uh, the pla2 or was being checked or uh, even people knew that if it, it it is or it will be available soon so so i think this is a change this is a recent yeah change. absolutely so when you came to pakistan uh, we checked because when you did gave the talk we also asked a few of the labs and i think nan in lahore were doing it at that point and i think that was in 2018 or 17 i guess yeah i think any any final comments final question before we uh, end the session um just a small comment i think uh, uh PLA2R would be one of the basic uh, tests in future in uh, adult patient coming in with nephrotic range protein urea because you do not know if it's membranous or some other lesion and uh, probably if it's negative we go on to uh, the renal biopsy since we do not have uh, immunofluorescence uh, as yet on renal biopsies we would continue to depend on serum levels uh my question uh, would be uh, uh if it's uh, uh, pertinent to continue to uh, do pla2r subsequent to a biopsy if uh, membranous is uh, uh, the diagnosis with the normal or negative pla2r 
mean, I think if uh, the serum is negative and biopsy is positive, that so, I mean, this is supposed to be inactive. That case, are you fine? Or I, I think then secondary workup needs to be done to make sure it's not cancer associated, or there is nothing else going on. Or twenty to thirty percent still idiopathic with other antigens. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, um, Numan, do we have uh, thrombospondin uh, available as yet? No, I don't th think so. You know, we are still happy with NTPL. It will, it will take another year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Umar, when you say that maybe it is cancer related, what is the basing of the bad screening for cancer that you are doing in the US? So, um, so there is age, I think I, we talked about it, so it's again, so there is age appropriate uh, screening, um, like, you know, for example, if somebody's due for colonoscopy and they are 44 or 45, I think you can send them the, the breast cancer screening, some of the lung cancer screening. I have gone to the level of, if I have um, like a suspicion very high, so once we, we made the diagnosis of membranous and PLA2 or was negative, I actually ordered a, a pan CT scan as well. Um, do we have like clear cut guidelines? I think I shared the protocol which uh, uh, Andy Bombeck has used at his his um, uh, center. Irfan, what's what has been your experience for the um, age appropriate or extensive cancer screening? Yeah, sure. And uh, you know, for for a, for a, for a guy, depending on age. Uh, chest X-ray slash CT scan, CT of the abdomen and pelvis colonoscopy, PSA, um, and for a female, obviously instead of the PSA, we do mammograms and um, a pelvic examination and pap smear. Will a virtual colonoscopy do? It it is possible. I think um, sometimes we. Um, use virtual colonoscopy with the Cologuard test, um, you know, the DNA test for cancer as a combination in some people who really can't get their colonoscopy prep straight um, for transplant preparation purposes. But if somebody can't really get their colonoscopy prep straight, that is probably an indication you should be transplanting them in the first place. But uh, I have used a virtual colonoscopy with Cologuard in that um, arena, I really don't know uh, um, um, if there's any data in cancer screening for GMs. This is all taken up from oncology literature. So we kind of asked them, what would you do? And, or GI people, what would you do? And some of them are doing this. So. Numan, no uh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I was saying that the, the, the the risk of a malignancy in a PLA2R positive case is really, really low. It's not zero, but it is low. But if you're dealing with a PLA2R negative case, as is the case in Pakistan, because in your primary bucket, you either have PLA2R or you have unknowns because you don't have the other antigens, especially in that unknown bucket, you probably need to do a Noman, any uh, experience uh, in getting a nephrotic patient to get a colonoscopy before you proceed to the treatment? No, I think that's a very uh, uh, valid point that you have raised and Dr. Irfan has uh, pointed to, that any patient who is going for, uh, uh, if you're going for the immunosuppression, so we usually go for you know stool for a cult blood, chest x-ray and you know an ultrasound and uh, basically that's it because you know the more you add the more it's going to just uh, um, add to the cost ultimately however if the same patient is going for a transplant and you have done an ntpla2r and that is negative then you have to go for all these things with the colonoscopy and everything i think this is the major important point that we have to remember uh, but age appropriate uh, Cancer screening, yes. I think that is the way to go. Uh, yeah, the breast that, examination, yeah. a pelvic examination, a pap smear, and maybe, you know, the uh, uh, mammogram. So I think chest X-ray and these kind of things, that's, uh, we don't go beyond uh, uh, these things, at least in my practice, because uh, the patients do not agree for all these things. They have very 
um, uh, reluctantly agreed for biopsy and after finding the, finding the biopsy report uh, then they will uh, you know start questioning uh, that you know why you're doing all this stuff so yeah, i think well, there is a very thin line here you know that we just have to Well, that that was actually um, just a brigadier yes, sahab ne bhi because that was actually the main question because colonoscopy i guess would have to be a major part of most patients that we see but you know i think if if we talk uh, colonoscopy i think they would rather have the renal biopsy done rather than <laughs> say they would have a colonoscopy done now I, i i think we need to actually temper some of this with uh, another facet uh, and that is the relative incidences of colon cancer colorectal cancer in a pakistani population compared to a us population um so you know some of these things and screening protocols although you know technically if you've got nephrotic syndrome you're not screening anymore but um from a screening standpoint the incidence of colorectal primary incidence of colorectal cancer in a pakistani population is very low it's not i mean obviously you get colorectal cancer there but from a screening standpoint the incidence is lower than a um comparable us population similarly if you look at a japanese population it's lower still but their risk of upper uh, gi cancer esophagus and gastric cancer is much higher so their entire life is spent on screening for gastric cancer just as we spend a lot of energy on colon cancer so i think in in a population in the united states uh we insist on a colon cancer uh, screen more robustly in pakistan under prevailing circumstances if you have a virtual colonoscopy set up with a good ct scanner and you can do a colocard test i think that may just suffice but that's something a gi person needs to comment on who's practicing in pakistan to help understand what the real risk is i don't think we have the colocard test here But I think Omar, your point is well taken. There? That yeah, I think the point is well taken that you have to uh, search more aggressively if you have an NTPLA two or negative membranes going for transplant. I think that's the uh, that's a, that's a very important. Uh... Nice, uh, nicely put, uh, Noman and uh, Irfan. Omar, I think uh, is. somewhere else so irfan would you like to sum up wind up yeah omar is there actually omar please go ahead no i think i, I was just thinking like you know okay, uh, if no more comments maybe we can uh, adjourn our meeting and uh, i already have a uh, you know motion to adjourn so if everybody else agree then uh, you know we we can adjourn i think next session is uh, exactly in in a month from now um and i look forward to increase our attendance i think today um you know we just probably need to do a slightly better job in uh, sending a reminder a day or two ahead of the time because i think uh, the momentum we created i just we just need to continue so thank you everyone who joined today um the the recording i can imagine will be available on the youtube uh, for watching later and um, everybody have a good rest of the day, rest of the day and enjoy thank you Love thank you very much